hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, if I could just for a moment, while, while I speak for CyberArk, um, I want to say how much of a privilege it is to be here in the room, but also be present at the inaugural Security Field Day. Um, both CyberArk and this humble engineer can't thank you enough for the invite, as well as all the questions that no doubt will pour in over the number of sessions today. Uh, so by way of introduction, my name's Brandon. Uh, I'm an engineer at CyberArk. I've, I've been with the, uh, the company for around five years. Uh, my main areas of focus are uh, emergent technology secrets management, uh, application secrets management, as well as just, well, general secrets management too. Uh, and in this session, we'll talk a little bit about CyberArk as a solution as well as a company, why we exist, um, when we began to exist, and what this whole hubbub is about privilege access security. Uh, now, We'll start with a quote, and uh, the quote is a little bit old, uh, but I like it. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie. Uh, back in 2012, uh, Robert Mueller, back when he was the director of the FBI, and regardless of how you feel about him today, uh, uttered a quote that we all use all the time. But I'll submit to you, we only use half of that quote. Um, I'll paraphrase because I'm not going to be all weird and turn around back and look at it, but there are two types of companies, those who have been hacked and those that will be. And then we cut it off because that feels really good. That feels like a good, complete thought. But the other half, I think, is even more powerful. The ones that have been compromised and those that will be compromised again. And every single security vendor is going to tell you, well, here's the reason why that is. So I admit that I'm a little bit biased. But uh, myself, as well as CyberArk, believe that these breaches are caused primarily by those delicious, creamy, new, creamy, nougaty, crispity, crunchity, privileged accounts that are in every single environment. Domain admin, local admin, UID zero accounts, those built-in accounts on mainframes and industrial control systems, and even on things like Coca-Cola freestyle machines, those little things you put in, you mix up your, your beverage at the movie theater, they have privileged accounts too. They all are there. And attackers look for them because let's face it, Breaches aren't happening because of least privilege. This was the reason that CyberArk came into being, to provide some sort of vault for you to store these uh, privileged accounts later. It actually started as just a vault, right? Put stuff in this secure location. It wasn't until a couple of years later that we realized everybody was just storing passwords. Then it clicked. Eureka, let's move forward with this. Now, if you've not heard of CyberArk before, uh, we've been in business since 1999. Uh, since then, we've amassed over 4,200 customers all over the globe. Uh, this includes 50% uh, of the Fortune 100 and 50% of the Fortune 500, too, that are gracious enough to trust them with the keys to their proverbial kingdom. By the way, there are only so many metaphors you can use for privileged accounts, so you're going you're gonna to hear a couple of them. Um, please don't get mad at me if I use them again and again. But in any case, they trust us with these. Now, in terms of the verticals we support, it's all over the place. Of course, your highly regulated industries like banking, power, uh, I'll tell some stories about utilities in a little bit that kind of harken back to Superman 3, but also retailers, large credit card companies, airlines, transportations, they've all got privileged accounts. Now, today is about you. So I will be very brief on the next two slides, but I can't not say it. Naturally, uh, there exists great minds outside of this room and outside of the folks watching on the web uh, that serve in an independent analyst functionality. I'm glad to say they agree with our assessment that privilege is important. Uh, we've been ranked by folks like Forrester as the uh, um, uh, kind of top right in both uh, ability to execute as well as vision. And this year uh, was the inaugural uh, Gartner Pam Magic Quadrant where we were also ranked as a leader. But enough about Gartner, because today is your day. Uh, so let's start at the basis. Now, I know a lot of you in the room and a lot of you watching have security backgrounds. Some of this is going to sound you're like, I know this, Brandon, I know. But, but let's, let's establish a baseline. Let's look at your traditional breach. Now, we're going to use this as a way to uh, expand how the threat surface looks today. Let's start with a pretty, pretty straightforward breach. And with my favorite source of public user information, good old LinkedIn. So we've got a bad guy hanging out on LinkedIn, learning everything there is to know about their target, uh, what they support. Oh my gosh, they like animal welfare and puppies because who doesn't like puppies? They've worked for these companies. They went to these schools. Here are their connection. So many breaches start with that initial infiltration through phishing. 
if you send me a link to a funny cat video, even being in security, and some would say a security professional, I'll still click it. I can't not click it. It could be the best cute funny cat video ever. So user is fished. Now I'll talk a little bit about local administrative rights in further sessions, but man, if that user has local admin rights on their laptop, life has now become so much easier from a threat actor perspective. By using those local administrative rights or finding someone else who has them, we're able to start the process of escalation. In this case, by the way, this is actually, uh, this was a live breach that we looked at, but in this case, uh, an executive user uh, was compromised. They had local admin rights. We were able to then dump hashes, happened to find the hash of the help desk user who had assisted that executive user beforehand, right? Kerberos-based authentication leaves behind hashes. I'll talk about mitigation for that later, but now the attacker can start the process of lateral movement. By leveraging that help desk user's hash, they're able to connect to, say, a server in the environment. Dumping the hashes on that server means we can continue to rinse and repeat until we've got something really delicious, a domain administrative account. Once domain admin is popped, we're like a kid in a candy store. Full access, irreversible network takeover is possible here, and of course, the exfiltration event occurs. Now, Golden Ticket, of course, is an incredibly popular Kerberos-based attack method, but we used past the hash to get there. There are also other types of attacks as well that I'll talk about more when I talk about CyberArk Labs in a little bit. But at this point, our attacker, having compromised the environment, is now able to profit, just like happy Scrooge McDuck swimming around in his coins. Which, by the way, his neck would like to be broken. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You can't swim around in, in coins like that. But in any case, that's, that's how it operates. Now, if you uh, put that into a fancy marketing-looking graphic, it looks like this. Once we've breached the perimeter, so whether we're dealing with an external compromise or an external compromise, uh, the goal is to rinse and repeat, kind of like, uh, like a privileged washing machine. Now CyberArk uh, understands the importance of having a strong network perimeter. I know a lot of folks in the room have networking backgrounds. That doesn't change. But once you get in, we've got to assume that compromisation is possible. The other thing that in, in my kind of breach uh, flow uh, we assumed was that this was primarily an Active Directory driven environment, that we were running Windows. It's not always the case. Attackers are more connected than ever. We as people are more connected than ever, which means the threat surface is increasing. I'll talk a little bit about the cloud threat surface too, but also things you wouldn't necessarily think about, like publicly facing uh, programmable logic controllers in industrial control systems. Things that can control the amount of water sanitizer that goes into municipal water supplies are externally facing. You can hit them over the public internet. And yes, it takes some work to get there, potentially, but many of them use built-in administrative accounts. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, uh, but there was a POC in, uh, at Georgia Tech, I'm from Atlanta, where they were actually able to install ransomwares on a specific type of PLC to slowly increase the amount of sanitizer to water until the ransom was paid. It's right out of Superman 3. So privileges all over the place. Our goal at CyberArk, yes? Are you suggesting that you're seeing more and more SCADA systems directly accessible from the internet, not air-gapped or indirectly air-gapped? So not a number of more, it's simply more being uncovered. Mm. So using tools like, for instance, Shodan is mm -hmm. a quick one, we're seeing more and more cases where areas we thought were air-gapped aren't. Mm. And it's not because engineers are malicious or the security team didn't have enough information, it's simply because the systems have been around so long that the access simply kind of creeped up and now we've got this project and this thing to clean up that was inherited maybe from four or five teams back. So our goal is to break that chain. Now, everyone will tell you we get as close to 100% as possible, but no security vendor is infallible. My goal, CyberArk's goal, is to make the process of lateral movement as caustic as possible for an attacker. It has to be acidic. The goal is for folks to turn around, to give up, to potentially target something else. And it's doing that without making our users just hate the level of security we put into play. And I'll talk more about that approach uh, in a little bit. Now, when we take this, uh, this idea and translate it into actually stuff that you can install, the portfolio looks a little bit like this. And, and we organize things into what we call the core and then the elements of a phase two, phase three, add on uh, other things that other companies might not have. But these three elements in the core, the things we'll be seeing first, are what every single one of our customers will deploy in their phase one. That is a secure vault 
for storing, discovering, and rotating passwords. I'll talk more about rotation logic in future sessions. Uh, giving humans access to it. Making sure those humans are strongly authenticating. So integrating with things like multi-factor. Now when a user's there and they have access to their stuff, it also is about using the accounts that are stored within. And yeah, you can check out passwords all day, but I prefer connecting users directly, isolating their systems from the targets they're connecting to. So all those nasty memory scrapers, keystroke loggers, and stuff that you might not have control of on the endpoint don't gain access to those very privileged accounts while monitoring everything that's happening. So actually creating an audit trail, which is a beautiful thing. Now, we've got all these secrets. We're doing all this access. But what about analytics? Well, I've got all this good information. Why not apply analytics to it to where I can notify of super weird anomalies on the most powerful accounts? Should do that. But also take action. If I'm already rotating passwords and I detect a pass the hash attack, one of the best ways to mitigate that is just rotate. That's all there is to it. We should be able to do that automatically, and we do. So these are the three elements of the core. Vaulting and rotation, session isolation and monitoring, strong and actionable analytics on top. Primarily for humans, but the attack surface isn't human anymore, right? The robots are uprising. I'll talk more about that in a bit. So uh, also, removing hard-coded secrets from applications, from scripts, from configuration files called password.py that you'll see in a further session. And doing that for traditional applications, think J2EE, WebSphere, WebLogic, Tomcat, but also more ephemeral applications too. Right? The, there's the concept of Jenkins, the, uh, the DevOps butler. These processes exist ephemerally. They must have secrets management that can also exist in that state. So applications are something that we touch and something that is near and dear to my heart personally. Uh, this also extends to endpoint privilege management too. An attack starts right here. You saw how local administrative rights were used maliciously. Why not allow companies to remove those without completely shattering the earth beneath our IT processes? By the way, I said earth shattering. There was, a, there was an earthquake in, uh, in the southeast today. I leave for like five minutes and then like the world falls down there. So I'm, I'm hoping that all my patio furniture is standing up. <coughs> but we don't want to quake the earth out from under these processes. So we want to be very equanimous with endpoint controls. And then finally, 10 years ago, everything was on-prem. Right? We had our data centers, everything was happy, but since then, folks <coughs> have been moving to infrastructure and platform as a service. So for CyberArk, we couldn't stick with that on-prem story. You have to be able to deploy all or some of the solution inside of AWS or Azure or GCP. Now, admittedly, most of our customers are going in at a hybrid approach, where they've got some powerful stuff that exists on-prem and some stuff that exists in the cloud. So making sure that we can distribute out there is key for us. And you'll see that in a little bit when we talk more about the architecture of the platform. Security doesn't happen in a vacuum, though. CyberArk is really good, I think, at rotating passwords. It's like our thing. It's you know, been doing it for a while. But we're not so good at multi-factor. I don't do vulnerability scanning. Uh, robotic process automation, I can help with. But again, I can help. So one of the things that we've built over the past couple of years is something we call the C-Cubed Alliance. That is an alliance of over, at this point, it's almost uh, over 100 uh, certified partners out there. When I say certified, I mean that we do this together. So uh, for instance, uh, CyberArk and Duo for multi-factor. If you have a problem, contact either of us. It's not, oh, go talk to them. It's probably, probably their fault. So security solutions, multi-factor, uh, scanning solutions coming together <coughs> provide a cohesive uh, way forward. Um, now, one of the things that I, I can't be adamant enough about here is that these integrations weren't built just by CyberArk and Aqua kind of hanging out and having coffee and ice cream one day. Do, do people eat coffee and ice cream? In any case, having coffee and ice cream, whatever you choose to, to eat with your coffee together, it was driven by our customers, by our prospects, by you challenging us to become better. Now, if you look into CyberArk and you don't see something we integrate with, best thing you can do is just ask. Hey, CyberArk, hey, vendor, why aren't you working together? Chances are, we just didn't think about it, or no one had asked us before. So for those of you who are watching and maybe talking with CyberArk or looking at CyberArk, please ask us. Be vocal. It's very important. Same with you in the room. Now, making a product and you know, selling the product and then deploying it is one thing, but it's also massively important to research the environment, to understand some of the more emerging threats coming through. 
there is a division of CyberArk R&D that we've called CyberArk Labs. Uh, you'll find that our, our naming conventions at CyberArk are typically very, uh, they're very functional, uh, which is okay. But CyberArk Labs, um, their goal is twofold. Number one, uh, to ensure that our solution is secure. Uh, but number two, to make sure we're locating additional threat vectors out there. Um, you can find all of our research in our blog as well as at cyberarc.com. The other element of that is uh, many tools that we release are being open source today. I'll talk more about community in a little bit, but github.com slash cyberarc is a spot where you can find a number of tools available. The most recent being uh, uh, ZBang or, or for the Israelis is a bang, uh, which looks at a number of Active Directory level compromise and mitigation. So you've got to be able to have research, but also you've got to have a plan. There are tons of privileged accounts at every organization. And while many, of, many folks will come to us because they have an idea of what they want to manage, once they've achieved step one, well then what do you do? Where do we go next? Well, that's a good question. So over the years, Cyborg has developed what we call a hygiene program. Now I know what you're thinking. Hygiene kind of makes you think of uh, brushing your teeth and flossing your teeth. But I promise this is, this is good hygiene. The seven steps that every one of our successful customers has taken. From starting with eliminating irreversible network takeover, right, preventing that state where you either have to A, assume you've been compromised forever, or B, just burn everything and rebuild, uh, to handling well-known infrastructure accounts, to limiting the move of attackers internally, but also to doing things like managing SSH keys. Uh, my background is as a Unix application owner. My company managed the root account. I kept whistling and moving forward exactly as I would have before because I happened to have the root SSH key. You can rotate. I know it's not good to have a root SSH key. I didn't say I was a, I was a good person. Um, I've changed. I got, I got better. Um, but you can rotate the root account all day. The SSH key is outside of that. It's like locking that door but leaving that door wide open. So we want to make sure if we've got SSH keys, we're managing them too to securing um, SaaS-based applications too. Infrastructure as a service, I'll talk more about that later, as well as making sure we're handling the non-humans as part of that process. Now, our customers might not do every one of these. They may not even have DevOps. They may not have a cloud offering or a cloud um, uh, infrastructure, but it's the future. It's how the growth can occur. Finally, when it comes to development, there are three things we've been focusing on over the past couple of years. The first being simplicity. And I know that sounds kind of silly. Everybody's focusing on simplicity. But, but for me, we're modifying users' everyday work. And we're dealing with some of the most technical users in the biz. If I change their workflow negatively by plus or minus 5%, I go from happy, well-productive users to people who are lying on the floor rolling around telling me that they are literally going to die because the controls are too great. Um, I can tell you that, uh, that I personally uh, have threatened a member of a uh, previous security team that if they continued down that path, they would have a group of people outside their office with torches and pitchforks threatening to set their desks on fire. Using security solutions should not be difficult for our good users. It should be difficult for the bad guys. So you'll see some of that simplicity today, as well as making sure that we're handling uh, the emerging cloud as well as DevOps adoption. It has to happen. A lot of times we see shadow IT going where uh, our developers are building all these processes and security is over here looking in the window wondering what's going on. So we want to make sure those are coming together. And finally, analytics. Because I have so much good information, it would be negligent for me to not take action on the information that I have stored. Finally, uh, this innovation this is just part of our DNA. It's us. From way back in 2003 when we rotated our very first credential, to 2007, when we put out our first application secrets management, uh, our customers, prospects, partners, affiliates, you challenge us to become better. Uh, and it's because of this that we make sure to reinvest a large portion of our income back into research and development. We started as an incredibly technical company. That is simply not going to change. Thank you all.